Thank you again for joining us tonight in these Feed Your Faith studies. We've been talking about the necessity of, during times like this especially, feeding our faith and causing ourselves not to live by our doubts and all of the things that are of depression around us, but that we feed our faith and remember that our God is in control. No matter what may happen, no matter what the circumstances might be, Daniel in his time was a captive in Babylon, but he had to remember that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, and that's so today as well. We've talked about from the very beginning that it is absolutely essential to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the point is. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that is the reason we go to scripture. Many in our world today who claim to be religious very scarcely go to the scripture. They use it only as an illustration or maybe a, a by thought, something that's there that's just a little bit and the rest of it, stories and everything else. But if we're going to have our dependence upon God and have faith in him, we need to delve deeply into God's word to understand it as we've already seen we can because Paul says in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul told those at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 that when he wrote and they read, they could understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so that is our attempt as we do this. We've also pointed out the necessity of living by faith as it's seen in the scripture. The Hebrew writer had pointed out, for you have need of endurance, that after having done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The nature of saving faith is here contrasted with that which would lead to perdition. He's pointing out the fact that having done the will of God, you continue on. You be one of endurance or steadfastness in continuing to live as God would have you to live. Why? Because the just lives by faith. It's not just an acceptance of something in a moment from our mind. Faith is that which is an absolute dependence upon God. It is something where we are ones who are given to him and we recognize that he is the one who totally must lead us, that we must change our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions to be in line with what he tells us to do. If we do that, we have that faith under the saving of the soul. But if we shrink back, the Hebrew writer says, my soul has no pleasure in him, quoting God. God has no pleasure in those. They are not accepted who shrink back away from that faith into perdition. When we talk about this living by faith, I want us to go back just a little bit in what we talked about last night, and we'll keep going through some of these points. But the very reason that the Reformation came along in the time of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and others the very reason it came along was that there was a system that they looked at, the Catholic system that in that time was viewed as salvation by works, and truly, that is exactly what it turned out to be. The idea of Catholicism was that you had these seven ways by which you could get grace appropriated to you by God, and those ways had to be that which were given by a priest, because sacerdotalism sacerdotalism taught that these priests were endowed with an ability to give the grace that is from the church only if they were ordained as priests. And so when you talk about these various things, baptism, it had to be administered by a priest. Confirmation, reconciliation, the anointing of the sick, or what's sometimes called extreme unction, or the marriage, or holy orders having to do with the priesthood, or the Holy Eucharist, that all of those dispensed grace unto these people. And that grace came to them because it was owned by the Catholic Church. And so when they did certain things, 
then the church could give them the grace. It acted as an intermediary. That way, there was a priest that was between that one who's a believer, that Catholic believer, and the things of God. What we find out in the New Testament is that we are all priests to God through Jesus Christ, that he indeed is the high priest, but that we can come to God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. But in this time, this idea was as long as you did the right things, these actions that were there, then you got the grace dispensed to you from that Catholic church. Martin Luther saw especially the selling of the indulgences in the time of Tetzel, Tetzel, an intermediary or uh, one who acted on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. In the selling of indulgences, his claim was that those who are in purgatory, burning off some venial sins, as they called, could be at advanced to heaven immediately if someone paid for them an indulgence and they then popped up their souls into heaven rather than being in purgatory. Well, that had to be something that was inviting if one believed that, that an individual by just giving some money could cause this one to be brought into heaven from the place of purgatory. But it went beyond that. And even at the time, there were those who bought these indulgences, expecting them to take care of a sin that they were going to be those that would commit in the future. In other words, maybe on Friday night, I was going to get drunk and do something that was wrong in the sight of God. That drinking, the other sins that I might have in mind. Then if I bought an indulgence, they claimed they had that ability to be forgiven in advance of that. Well, that was exactly what Tetzel also claimed at that time. But you see, Martin Luther saw this, and he saw the degradation of immorality that came from that. He saw repeatedly when he went to Rome as one who was a Roman Catholic monk that there were priests who were living in ways that were awful. They had their uh, mistress that was out there, even sometimes a whole family, even though they taught the need for celibacy. And he was disappointed and saw that there was indeed a need for people to get back to God. Martin Luther was evidently a very reverent man, also a man of uh, great, uh, I guess you would say, suspicions or things that had to do with uh, various ways of being, uh, in a way, scared of paranormal kind of things, things like that. Well, he was one who reacted to that idea of salvation by works, by just doing these works and through the priesthood, you could get this grace given to you. He reacted to that with another extreme in the opposite direction. And his concept was that we had salvation by faith only. And by the name of John Calvin came along a little bit after Martin Luther, and he was one who took that up a notch beyond that, denying the free will of man. His concept was that you had this absolute sovereignty of God, that you as an individual in the flesh were so evil, you could not do anything good without the Holy Spirit coming into you and causing you to believe. So faith didn't come by hearing the word of God as far as Calvin was concerned. Faith came by that kind of irresistible grace that was sent to them and then the Holy Spirit made them alive and able to believe. And once one did that, Calvin taught they could never be lost no matter what they did. Well, what was the problem? The Bible does teach salvation by faith, but the Bible does not teach salvation by faith only. Those two are very different. Over and over in the word of God, I can see that salvation must take place only where there is faith. If one tries to be one right in the sight of God, accepted of God without that faith, it's absolutely impossible. Hebrews 11 verse 6, John 3 16, we could go on and on. The fact is that salvation must have faith, but it's not by faith only. We started by noting that in the book of James. Martin Luther was one who believed in salvation by faith only, as we said. 
And so he started to look through the book of James and he called it an epistle of straw. Finally, he was one that uh, said that it was not really a canonical epistle. It was not something that was inspired and it ought to be thrown out of the Bible. Well, there's every evidence that it is indeed that which is of the canon of scripture that God by his providence maintained. Now, how do we know that that salvation is not by faith only? Let's see why it is that James gave Martin Luther such a problem. In James chapter one, he starts out with saying, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in his doing. What's the point? The point is very clear. The idea here is if one hears and he does not do, what's going to happen? God doesn't have any acceptance of him. He makes that clear even more in verses 26 and 27, finishing out the chapter by saying, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. Now notice it. This one's religion is useless, pure and undefiled religion before God. And the father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. The idea is it's not just your acceptance, your allegiance to God. That has to be something that transforms into your action before God and man. You remember Jesus pointing out the fact that the first two commandments when he was asked by that one uh, who was testing him, he said, what are the first, or what's the first and great commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is like unto it, you love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang the law and the commandments. Well, what's the point? That's the same thing that James is talking about. It's exactly what Jesus had declared, that one has to show that faith in the Father by doing those things that are a proper reverence for him, keeping himself unspotted before the world, sanctified unto God. And he must be the one who helps his fellow man, who loves that fellow man. How? Visiting the orphans and the widows in their time of trouble. In other words, meeting their needs. But it doesn't stop there. James introduces that necessity of being a worker, but he goes on in chapter two. We noticed this passage last night. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked, and destitute of daily food. And one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The idea there of making it very clear, here someone says, I have faith, but they're not going to put that faith into action by doing what God has declared then is it going to be something that is a saving faith? Is it going to be a faith that is useful? No, it's not. If it does not work and obey God, loving God and loving one's fellow man, then it has not worked a faith that is saving in its nature towards God. When you look at James chapter 2 and in verse 18, the statement is made very clearly there. James chapter 2 and in verse 18 through 24. But someone will say, I have faith, or you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see 
that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's what this book declares. It points it out very clearly that if we are going to be saved, it has to be our faith working, being changed in every facet of our lives by what God would have us to be, following him. When you look at the very last verse, that he sums it up by saying, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You can't miss the very clear point that James is making and that is just an acceptance of certain facts or a mental acceptance of a certain path that does not have that saving quality of faith. The saving quality of faith does something, and remember Hebrews chapter 10, it continues in the doing that. Does it shrink back? But it has faith unto the saving of the soul. Well, what does that tell us then? That faith without works is dead means it's useless. It's something that does not save. It's only that which is going to be one's admission of a thought, but not a change of a life. When you believe a doctrine, salvation by faith only, and the only time in our English Bible you find those two words together, faith only, is in verse 24 of James 2, and it says, not by you need to take a second look at that doctrine. When God says it's not by faith only, I need to take a look and see why is it that someone is taught that's all that's necessary before God. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at a test case. I went to a Baptist seminary for my graduate work. And while I was there, we oftentimes talked about the Apostle Paul, or as he was called Saul at that time. Many people look at that case and they think what they find is a case where one was saved by faith only. I want to challenge that thought with you if I might. I want you to take down your Bible, look at the passages we're going to notice. And over the next couple of nights, we're going to try to say, what does the New Testament say about when Saul was saved? Was he saved at the point of faith along the Damascus Road? Or was there another point where the Bible tells us that he was saved? What does Paul say about that himself later on in the epistles as to when he touched that blood of Jesus Christ and came to be forgiven of his sins by that? We've noted the fact that without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no cleansing of sin. When did Paul come in contact with that blood? Paul points out in 1 Timothy chapter 1, as we'll notice, that he is an example of one's salvation. That in him, as the chiefest of sinners, God might show grace to make salvation possible so that man would know he would accept anyone despite the past sins that that one has. That's correct. So Paul must be, he claimed to be, and the Spirit inspired him to say that he was an example. When and how was he brought to the point of salvation? Hope you'll join us again then. I might say to those who are members of the 84th Street Congregation in Oklahoma City that we've heard good words from our uh, governor today that on May 3rd we'll be allowed to meet once more uh, in this state, and we're looking forward to that. The elders are meeting before uh, the coming Sunday, and they'll be in communication with you, but look forward to our day of worship on May the 3rd, the Lord willing, and we'll be back together. I've missed you all so much. I know that all of us who are at the 84th Street Congregation have a great love for one another. That's something that this congregation has been known for. And I want you to know that I've missed you, Leslie has, and we hope to be back with you then. And once again, praise God together.
lift up our voices in song and prayer to him, thank him for all that he's done and have that exhortation of one another that we all so desperately need and benefit by. May God bless you all. Good night.